Good afternoon. Thank you for joining us for today's news conference with members of the Expedition 30 and 31 space station crews. Joining us today are NASA astronaut Don Pettit, Russian cosmonaut Oleg Kononenko, and European Space Agency astronaut Andrei Kuipers. The three are scheduled to launch on or near December 26th from Kazakhstan and will round out the six-person crew aboard the International Space Station. We'll start with introductions and then take questions. To my left is NASA astronaut Don Pettit, who will serve as flight engineer for Expedition 30 and 31. Don was born in Silverton, Oregon, and holds degrees from Oregon State University and the University of Arizona. After college, he worked as a scientist at Los Alamos National Laboratory in Los Alamos, New Mexico, on projects including experiments on board NASA's KC-135 reduced gravity aircraft. Selected as a NASA astronaut in April 1996, Dr. Pettit is a veteran of two space flights and has logged more than 176 days in space and more than 13 hours of spacewalk experience. He lived aboard the International Space Station for five and a half months in 2002 and 2003 as part of the Expedition 6 crew and in 2008 returned to space as a member of the 126 crew. To his, next, uh, I'm sorry, to his left, we have Russian cosmonaut Oleg Kononenko, who will serve as flight engineer for Expedition 30 and as commander for Expedition 31. Oleg was born in Turkmenia and graduated from Kharkov Aviation Institute. After graduation, he worked at the Central Design Bureau as a design engineer. In 1996, Oleg was selected to the Cosmonaut Corps and in 2008 flew aboard the space station as a flight engineer during Expedition 17. Last, we have European Space Agency astronaut Andre Kuipers, who will serve as a flight engineer for the mission. Andre was born in Amsterdam of the Netherlands and received his physician's degree from the University of Amsterdam. He worked with the European Space Agency in support of physiological experiments before joining the European Astronaut Corps in 1999 and traveled to the International Space Station on the Delta mission in 2004. With that, we'll now take questions here from the Johnson Space Center, and we'll start over on the left. If you can please start by stating your name and affiliation. Mark. Hey, thank you, uh, Mark Corot for Aviation Week and Space Technology. And I'm um, sort of interested in what you're trained and what you're prepared to do with uh, either the uh, SpaceX Dragon or the Orbital Sciences uh, Cygnus um, demonstration missions in the upcoming months and year. Uh, well, uh, Andre and I and Dan Burbank have been training primarily for the track and capture phase because both of these vehicles uh, come close to space station and then we sort of have to lasso them with the robotic arm and, and reel them into the station. And we've been practicing the dynamics of how you do that and we practice that a lot. And then once you get these vehicles berth to station, then it's pretty much standard ops for any vi visiting vehicle where you open up the hatches and there's a whole bunch of goodies inside that you offload. And then we fill it full of a bunch of, uh, I guess I call them anti-goodies, our, our garbage and things that we want to dispose of. And then we reverse the process. We uh, unberth the vehicle using the robotic arm and hold it out as far as we can with the arm safely and then let go of the vehicle and it does a burn. And then uh, for some vehicles, they'll burn up in the atmosphere. Uh, uh, some vehicles will be coming back to Earth, uh, bringing payload with them. And just to, to follow up, if I may, um, what are you expecting or what are you prepared for each of these vehicles? In other words, are you thinking you'll see Dragon perhaps during your stay on the station? Will you see uh, a berthing? Will you see Cygnus? Is it still sort of in doubt and you're prepared for whatever comes? Oh, in terms of schedule, like so many schedules dealing with the space program, there are always uh, actually more than up in the air. They're out there in, in a vacuum. And we, we are prepared to do whatever happens during our mission in terms of a visiting vehicle uh, profile. At one time, we had nine visiting vehicles coming to our mission to the point where we were going to be longshoremen. And uh, now it looks like uh, a number of those vehicles have pushed off to uh, missions in the future. So we'll just have to see what happens in terms of vehicles showing up. We'll be prepared in any case. Hi, Robert Perlman with CollectSpace.com. 
Um, uh, with the August loss of progress uh, and the schedule changes that came after, how has your tr preparation for this flight changed and, and how will your activities on board the station as was originally planned change, if, if at all? Uh, in terms of training, my training is still basically on track for our original November 30th launch date. Uh, this Thursday is my last day of training here at the Johnson Space Center per the schedule, and then it's off to Japan and off to Germany, eventually ending up in, in Star City. There may be uh, a stretch point where uh, I might be able to grab a, a week or so of, of needed vacation and spend some time with my family. But uh, in terms of training, it's, it's pretty much going on track. And uh, if, uh, if each of you could comment, if there are um, any particular science, uh, science worker experiments that are going to be started during your stay on board that stand out in terms of uh, what you've been prepared to perform? Thanks. Well, we have uh, a lot. I think I have something like uh, 57 experiments, and uh, from uh, from NASA, from from ESA, and also from JAXA. And there's a lot of experiments uh, for uh, uh, for which I'm one of the subjects. If we talk about medical experiments, we need uh, always uh, uh, a lot of people to get good uh, statistics. Uh, so there will be experiments where uh, where I'm the the last one to uh, to uh, to yeah to be uh, a subject. Um, I look forward to uh, experiments that are uh, new for me, uh, so experiments on, on, on in different fields, uh, fluid physiology, the fluid physics, and things like that. Uh, so it's, there's a whole bunch of experiments that uh, that I'm looking forward to, and it's it's very hard to pick out a, a specific one. One of the things I like very much uh, is the, the fact that we are going uh, we're going to do a lot of uh, ultrasound, and that's a nice skill, especially uh, with my background. It's nice to uh, to make uh, nice pictures of uh, blood vessels, uh, your heart, uh, etc. So I look forward to that one. Gerhard Daum with the German Aerospace Center and Space Expo Association. Question for Andre. Are there any specific European experiments planned on your mission which are not already at the Columbus module, for example? Uh, there's a whole set of uh, experiments that I'm going to do for, uh, for ESA. A lot of different ones, uh, also in the Columbus module. Uh, and they, they vary from, uh, from human physiology uh, to, uh, to fluid physics. Uh, so, um, um, a whole list, and uh, uh, of course, it's an international space station, so that means that uh, Columbus is not only used for European experiments, but also for, uh, for experiments from, uh, from NASA, and we will do experiments all over the space station. Uh, but for sure, there will be a whole lot of, uh, of ESA experiments to be performed. All right, Gina. Gina Sinceri, ABC News for Don. If I recall correctly, you took a toolbox up to the space station on your first mission. Will you be bringing a toolbox box with you on this, and what skills do you think are most needed? Your plumbing skills, your electrical skills, your mechanical skills? Where do you think you'll be needed most? Oh, tools. Uh, we, uh, tools are one of my favorite subjects. Uh, you should see my garage at home. Uh, <laughs> We have lots and lots of tools on Space Station. We've added a lot more tools since the last time I was there. And I don't really need to bring any more tools because everything I could think of that I might need, well, almost everything I could think of is already there. In terms of repairs, what's my favorite kind of repair? Well, I guess it sort of depends on what happens to be broken. If, if liquid's squirting out someplace, then, then it, it's like I'm, I'm plumber for the day. If, if uh, uh, electronic box isn't working right, then, then you're uh, 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 electrical repairman for the day. So whatever needs to be repaired, I'm, I'm game to jump in and try to see if I can't help in concert with the ground. And you have to remember that, that space station is so complicated. No one person can keep everything, uh, all the details in your mind. And, and that's where we need all these folks on the ground that can tell you what this screw did and what that terminal does and what kind of fluid is flowing in that pipe that happens to be leaking out. And, uh, and so between our crew on station and working with the ground, uh, we'll be able to, to tackle almost any kind of uh, repair function that needs to be done. 
Uh, Kevin Quinn with KTRK TV here in Houston. Um, specifically for, for Don Pettit, how concerning is this report now about the, the long-term uh, spaceflight effects on astronaut eyesight? And have any of you actually noticed any effect on your own eyesight? Um, one of the scientific purposes for going into frontiers is to figure out what happens to human physiology when you go there. And so whether it's bone density issues or vascular issues, things dealing with circulation, your immune system gets affected. There's lots of effects that happen to the human body. Um, and we're just getting a handle around uh, some of these eye retinal issues that are occurring and, and uh, what the total effect is going to be, I don't think anybody knows right now. It's a fascinating area of research, something that doesn't, uh, something that we can't do here on Earth right now in terms of the physiology, the physiological forces that are, that are driving these issues. So this is one of the, the neat things about venturing off into space is that we, we, we have another knob that we can experiment with. It's called a gravity knob, and we can look at its effect on human physiology. How concerned are you, though, about the, the long-term effects on your own eyesight? And, and um, have you noticed anything? Uh, I'm, I'm not concerned about that. Uh, these aids seem to be reversible when you come back to Earth. For example, you regain your bone density, your vascular system springs back, so does your immune system. And right now, we don't have enough data on this to, to see what is going to happen. Jeremy Diesel with KHOU here in Houston. What, if anything, is different in the training mode, knowing that it's possible that you could arrive, depending on how things go, to a space station that's empty? Uh, we actually train that scenario. We train a scenario where you're the last crew that has to mothball station and uh, you know, showing up to a station with nobody on it is is just one more facet of what it means to to uh, go off and explore. Uh, it's certainly uh, uh, an option that I hope doesn't happen. Okay, we'll turn over to the side for some questions. Okay. Uh, uh, Jim Oberg with, with NBC. Um, there's a big change in your EVA training since the assembly is complete, and now you're all going to be Don Pettit, you're all going to be ready to go out and take care of unexpected failures. So how has that affected all of your training for EVA? All three of you, please, because uh, uh, Mr. Kononenko, you had to go out and remove a pyrotechnic charge unexpectedly on your last, last space flight, and that was a pretty amazing piece of work. But you're going to have to do unexpected EVAs rather than scheduled EVAs. How has that tra changed your training and your attitude about spacewalks? I know you like it better. That's the answer. Uh, actually, the way most of the training for space station crews, it's based on skills. And in order to learn the set of skills needed to put together a spacesuit while you're inside a station and, and service it and do everything you need uh, by the time you open the door of the airlock, those are pretty much generic skills. And then what you do when you get outside uh, we train a, a generic set of skills based on uh, 10 to 12 big probable failures, uh, pump packages, uh, FHRCs, these rotary hose couplings, uh, boxes filled with uh, switching units, <coughs> batteries. We get trained for all these generic kinds of, of uh, uh, repair functions that maybe you'll have to do, maybe you don't. And then if something else comes up that doesn't fall in that category, you have the skill set to be able to go out and do that. Andrea, you, are you, you're going to help. You're going to assist. You're, you're fully EVA trained for the repair work. That's correct, yes. So uh, yeah, this is one of the nice aspects of the whole training is, of course, the, the, the EVA preparation. And we spent a lot of time in, uh, in preparing this, this maintenance task. Uh, so uh, I feel fully ready. Uh, if anything uh, comes up uh, and have to go out, uh, fully ready to, uh, to to do so. And and I might add, one of the more difficult tasks when you're doing a complex EVA, 
Everybody's focused on the people that are outside. But one of the most complicated tasks is the person inside flying the robotic arm, because that is not necessarily an easy thing to do. And you're flying a really complicated trajectory that you've never rehearsed before. And, and, and so it's really a team of, of at least three on orbit working in conjunction with all the folks on the ground where you have the two people outside coupled with a person inside that are, that's flying the arm. All right, Jill. Jill Tolk, representing the Statesman Journal in Salem, Oregon. Since that's your hometown area, Don, you know this question's for you. Um, back when you flew on 126, social media was just kind of blossoming at that time, but Twitter and Facebook and such things weren't as popular at that point as they are now. I know you have a Twitter account, but what are your plans for sharing your mi mission via s social media and perhaps blogging for Fragile Oasis? Uh, I'm planning to use Twitter. I have a hard time saying anything in less than 140 characters. <laughs> and, uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm still groping with how can I use that kind of medium. I think I'm going to use Twitter to announce one of my blogs, which will appear on, on uh, NASA websites. Or, or elsewhere. And then I'm, I've got a Facebook account, and I just figured out how to convert it from one of your personal profile pages into, I guess they just call it a page. So that way, uh, anybody that wants to go in there and see what's happening can just go in and, and visit your Facebook account. And, and so I'm, I'm planning to, to keep, uh, well, I personally won't keep those all up to date, but I'll send the information down, and folks here will populate those during my mission. Thanks very much. Now, a very important scientific question for you. How might you incorporate hatch chilies into your mission? Oh, hatch chili from New Mexico. Um, I tried to fly hatch chili on one on uh, Expedition 6, but it was fresh hatch chili, and, and that didn't meet the, the food standards. Uh, so I wasn't able to do that uh, in, in fresh form. So we had some canned uh, chili. This time, uh, this time, uh, there will be no chili on, uh, on Space Station. OK, with that, we'll now switch over to the Kennedy Space Center, where we have a reporter. Um, Todd Halverson of uh, Florida Today. Um, uh, for any of you, I was just wondering, um, what is the latest you've heard on the um, investigation into the August 24th uh, Soyuz failure and uh, and the return to flight uh, effort. Uh, that sounds like an Oleg question. Ну я могу ответить только то, что на официальном сайте Роскосмоса есть информация о завершении работы специальной комиссии. Комиссия установила причину. Ну вот теперь проверяется двигатели, которые будут установлены на различных ракетах, которые будут выводить различные космические корабли. Вот. И руководство Роскосмоса установило новые предполагаемые даты пилотируемых стартов. Uh, I can only say that uh, Roscosmos, on Roscosmos site, there is information of, um, about this. Um, there is a special committee that uh, finalized uh, its activities and um, published uh, the statement. They found the uh, root course of the matter, and now the new thrusters uh, have been manufactured, and they will be tested on different rockets. And Roscosmos also um, is announcing a new dates of launches uh, for the rockets. Thanks. And I, I was just uh, wondering for, uh, for any of you uh, what your thoughts are on the uh, reliability of the Soyuz launcher as well as the reliability of uh, the Soyuz spacecraft that you'll uh, return to Earth, and um, are, are you concerned at all, Mr. Pettit, about the possibility of a ballistic reentry? Uh, uh, ballistic reentries are just sort of one of those little facts of life that happen, and I'm, I'm actually happy to have a ballistic entry capability because that's like carrying a spare tire. And, 
And so when the normal guided entry doesn't work right, then you download to a ballistic entry. In terms of anxiety getting on a rocket, uh, I, I have more anxiety sitting here in front of all of these news cameras than I do climbing up on top of a rocket. Okay, with that, we'll be switching over to the phone bridge where we have three reporters. Uh, we'll start with Tracy Watson representing USA Today. Hi, can you hear me all right? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, thanks. Uh, for Dr. Kuypers, I'd like to ask a variation of Todd's question. How does it affect your calculation of the risk of the Soyuz ride to have these recent incidents in the past? It's a very, very reliable vehicle. So do these, do these recent unfortunate mishaps um, change, tweak that perception at all, or, or, or how, do you, how do you view it? Thanks. Uh, no, it doesn't. I mean, it, indeed, uh, there have been hundreds of uh, good launches. It's a very reliable rocket, uh, a very reliable spaceship. Uh, the, one of the first things that, uh, that you have to remember is that uh, uh, if this would have been a manned Soyuz, there would have been another situation. We started in 1975. And we have a, a great uh, escape system uh, as well, and uh, the, the Soyuz would have been landed nicely uh, by parachute. So uh, when it happened, I, I didn't have for a moment a doubt uh, that, uh, that we would uh, continue and uh, that we uh, um, would be in a safe rocket. So no problems, like Don said, uh, to, uh, to board uh, the spacecraft. Thank you. Okay, next on the line, we have Claire Moskowitz with Space.com. Hi, this is also a question for Dr. Kuipers. I was just wondering if you could tell us um, what does it mean to people back in the Netherlands to have you going into space, and, and how closely do you think people will be following your mission back home? Um, well, uh, a bit to my surprise, there's a, a lot of attention again. Uh, this is the second flight, but it's, uh, of course, a complete new uh, generation of, uh, of uh, young people as well who are interested. Uh, so, so for small countries, of course, uh, a flight of, an, uh, of a national astronaut is a, is a big thing. And uh, I think this is also a good thing because it's a way to, to make clear that science and technology is very uh, exciting and interesting. Uh, so uh, I think the, the, there's a lot of attention now, and uh, uh, the European Space Agency also uses it to, uh, to have a great educational program as part of the mission. So, um, uh, yeah, surprisingly a lot. Uh, maybe even more than last time also because of the social media nowadays. Uh, and I think that uh, it, it uh, will be followed uh, during the whole uh, period of the flight. Thanks. Okay, our last question uh, from the phone bridge will be from Ian Overton with 21st Century Science Magazine. Mm -hmm. Sorry. The, uh, Let's stand by one second. Hi, it's Bill Harwood. I've got a question. Okay, we'll hold Ian and go ahead, uh, Bill. Thanks. Um, for Don Pettit, um, are we going to have a revival of Science Saturday? Oh, are we going to have a revival of Science Saturday? Uh, yes, we are, but it will have to be done during off-duty time. And as you know, crews on Space Station are kept pretty busy doing just the programmatic work and the maintenance on Space Station. We do have some off-duty time. And I plan to use my off-duty time to working on simple scientific demonstrations, and I'll downlink them when I can. They'll probably be done on a, a Saturday afternoon. Thanks. And uh, you know, during your first day on the station, it was in the, in the you know assembly phase and all of that. Whereas now it's utilization. What are you looking forward to the most for your second visit? Is it doing the experiments? Is it or is it just simply being back up there again? Uh, I like working on what the purpose of space station is, which is using it to do something meaningful in terms of facilitating human exploration. And that falls into two categories that I see. There's scientific research, and then there's a category I like to call engineering research. And whenever you use the word research, you have to remember what that means is the answers are not in the back of the book. You're doing something that you really don't know what the outcome is going to be. And scientific research, I think folks have a pretty good idea about what that means. Engineering research uh, is involved with the spacecraft systems and 
themselves. For example, on station, we're working with this regenerative life support system. And that's a fancy way of saying that we try to recycle as much as we can in terms of, of all the, the, the things that human beings consume. And it isn't easy. And we're, we've got uh, some equipment up there to do this. And we're, we're working on it every day, trying to keep, keep, uh, keep it running and figuring out how to make it robust so that we can use technology like that when we really do venture away from planet Earth. And, and that's one of many legitimate functions for space station. And I, I look forward to doing either the scientific research or the engineering research. Thank you. Okay, I believe that concludes our questions from the phone bridge. So with that, we will switch back here to the Johnson Space Center. And Ian, why don't you go ahead? Yeah, hi, Ian Overton with 21st Century Science and Technology. A question, especially for a Russian friend, but anyone can also take it. Uh, the United States and Russia has a long history of collaboration in terms of national strategic missions uh, from the transcontinental railroad and hopefully far, far into the future. And so the question that I have is what, what do you see as uh, a direction for long-term future collaboration between the United States, Russia, and also China on space collaboration, manned space exploration? Я могу здесь сказать только свое персональное мнение. Мне кажется, что космос перестал быть спортивной ареной, где каждая страна должна демонстрировать, что она там быстрее, сильнее, выше. Мне кажется, что дальнейшее использование и исследование космического пространства можно проводить только совместно, в том числе и выполнять какие-то полеты там в более глубокий космос. То есть Я вижу в наше будущее, что мы будем работать совместно над всеми космическими программами. Uh, I can only express my personal opinion on that. I think that the space uh, has long ceased to be a sports arena where every participant demonstrates how fast or how cute uh, they are. Uh, I think that the future of the space exploration is only uh, belongs only to joint exploration. And we will be able to do deep space uh, missions only if we uh, cooperate together. So I see our future in joint cooperation. Did anyone else want to add? Okay. Um, any other follow-ups on this side of the room? Okay, we'll come back over here to Mark Rowe. Uh, thanks again, uh, Mark Rowe, for Aviation Week. And I wanted to follow up on an earlier question by Jim Oberg on the spacewalks. Uh, at this point, is there anything scheduled during your stay uh, for spacewalks, or are you basically only in a response mode to if there's a problem? Uh, currently, uh, there's nothing scheduled. We're, we're in a response mode. Uh, there's a, a, a one maintenance activity that's kind of in the wings right now dealing with the, with the S-band antenna. And it's currently working. It doesn't need to be replaced, but it, it seems like it, it has some, some issues. And uh, we'll leave it up to the, the folks with the long range plans to figure out when that needs to be replaced. Uh, we are, as a crew, uh, uh, ready to go out and, and, and do such an EVA if it were to fall during our, our mission. OK, I believe we have another follow up on the left. Kevin Quinn again with KTRK. Just a, a follow-up from my previous question about astronaut eyesight. Have any of you ever experienced blurred vision on orbit or post? Well, uh, you know, sometimes you, your eyes start to water just because you're looking at Earth and it's such a beautiful sight. And of course, you're going to have some blurred vision after that. All right, over to the side. Jill. Jill Tolk, representing the Statesman Journal. I want to follow up on Bill Harward's question uh, regarding not necessarily Saturday morning science, but perhaps Saturday afternoon science. Could you give a specific example off the top of your head, not to put you on the spot, but um, something that would illustrate to your hometown perhaps that might interest them? Oh, 
Well, one activity that I want to do is to uh, uh, sort of a continuation of something I did on Expedition 6, and this is with stretched thin films, which is just a fancy way of saying uh, soap films. And soap films have gravitational effects here, which is why a lot of bubbles pop. They drain down to the bottom. Soap films drain, and then they pop. And if you make such films in a weightless environment, uh, they, they don't drain, and they can last for days, sometimes weeks. I made some of these films that lasted over a month if you could uh, keep them from evaporating. And then you can make films that have no surfactant in them at all. You can just make uh, stretched films of pure water. And this is something you can't do down here on, on Earth. And, and these water films, I could make them to last over a month. So I have a series of, of investigations dealing with just little bits of wire and a water that we get from our uh, regenerative life support system. So you know what that water was uh, the day before. And uh, uh, anyway, I, I have some uh, ideas on what I want to do with these uh, stretched thin films. Thank you. Jim. Uh, Jim Oberg with NBC, NBC again. You are an all experienced crew and going back to the same space, not the same, a different space station. It's got a cupola up there. But how has going back to the station made your training, your training and preparation easier or harder? How has going back there changed the, 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 your training this time? Well, uh, when I were. Uh, when the first time I think the station was half the size of what it is now. And uh, indeed people ask me, uh, so why do you have to train so much, uh, so many years? I mean, you've been there already. Can't you just uh, get on board and go? Uh, well, it's, it's, it's pretty much different. A lot of new modules, a lot of uh, uh, new experimental uh, wrecks. Uh, the Soyuz that we fly in is, a, is, a, is a, a new version, so we have to train that. And of course, uh, a lot of it uh, is skills-based, so the, if you're flying uh, in 2004 and, and then again in 2011, it's, it's not something uh, that you can just do. So it's a lot of uh, additional training, but of course uh, you have uh, at least a good idea of what it's like to be weightless and how to, uh, to, uh, to deal uh, with equipment that's floating around and uh, how to stabilize yourself. So, so you have a good idea of what it would be like to, to perform certain operations. So that absolutely uh, uh, helps, but um, yeah, it still required a lot of additional training, of course. All right, and I believe we have one last follow-up. Hello, my name is Juliet. I'm with 21st Science and Technology. I have a follow-up question on the Russian-U.S. collaboration and, t and also international collaboration on the future of mankind in deep space. I'm just wondering uh, what type of collaboration do you think is necessary? And also, are you think what do you think about the, uh, the potential threat of cyclical mass extinctions every 62 million years we've seen on the Earth? and um, how mankind may begin to address that, that bigger galactic question. I'll, I'll tackle the, uh, the galactic question here. Uh, I'm a firm believer that one planet is not enough. And I like to say that perhaps the ultimate reason for exploring space can be learned from the dinosaurs. If the dinosaurs had explored space, if they'd colonized other planets, they would still be alive today. So I, I think this is ultimately why human beings, if, if we want to live on the time scale of tens to twenties of millions of years, we're gonna have to have more, we're gonna have to have our DNA on more than one planet. Okay, anyone wanna to respond to the other portion of our question? Ну и когда-нибудь все равно станет проблема ресурсов. Все равно человечество станет перед необходимостью добывать что-то себе. Поэтому, наверное, мы, скажем так, привязаны к необходимости исследовать другие планеты. 
Uh, well, I think that the uh, problem with resources will uh, be before the humanity sooner or later. Humanity will face this problem. And um, so the uh, humanity will have to actually look for some other additional means of existence. And I think uh, it will be an urgent need to explore uh, other um, galactics and other uh, planets. That's what I think. OK. Well. Oh, sorry, yeah. Andrew. Um, uh, we are around only for uh, since a short time, actually. Uh, and if we think in, in cosmic terms, I mean, I don't know who said the, this first, but we are standing uh, at the edge of an ocean. We're only with our toes in the water, and there's an ocean to, uh, to discover. Uh, so if you look back to our age from the far future, and then people will see uh, Sputnik, Gagarin, Armstrong, and then first base on Mars. Space station will be skipped because it would be normal. You have several industrial ones, etc. mining on the moon. That will all, all these things will happen. I'm convinced that, that uh, humanity will spread out through the solar system. Who knows beyond? I mean, it requires uh, quite a technology there. But uh, uh, that's for sure. But for the moment, we only have our planet. And, uh, and that's a very limited planet uh, with limited resources. And I think we have to be very careful with those planets first, uh, because uh, before we, we colonize other places, it will take some time. So we have to be careful there. OK, with that, we have uh, three questions that were submitted from the Dutch news agency, ANP. Uh, these first two are for Andre specifically, and the last one will be for all three of you. Um, Andre, the question is, your launch date is still to be formally determined. The launch was scheduled for late November at first, but has been pushed back to late December. How does this affect your training for the mission? Um, well, I think this question has uh, already been answered partly, at least, um, uh, by Don. Uh, the training is uh, continuing uh, as planned. Uh, there will be some additional time, and we will uh, fill that with uh, some extra leave, but also some, well, uh, if we wanted some uh, refresher training. Uh, but in principle, uh, um, we are ready to go. Actually, as a backup crew from, the, from half a year ago, we, uh, we could already launch uh, in that sense. Uh, so it doesn't affect uh, the training so much. And uh, um, yeah, if they, if they say tomorrow, oh, you, you fly anyway on the, on the 30th of November, we are ready to go. OK, the next question uh, is a two-part question. The Dutch people are becoming more and more aware of your mission. How do you intend to maintain that? And what are your plans when you return to Earth? Um, well, I'm an astronaut of the European Space Agency. Uh, that means that uh, uh, whole Europe uh, uh, is, uh, is involved. And after our flight, of course, one of the tasks that the astronauts have is to, to, to tell uh, and to inform the people of, uh, of what we did and, uh, and to follow it up. Uh, with presentations and, and debriefings, of course, and uh, uh, yeah, for the for the, the the Dutch people, I mean, the European Space Agency takes care of all the member states. Uh, so uh, it is important for astronauts uh, to be ambassadors for, of space flight. So we'll be uh, I will be uh, around in Europe, beside, of course, the normal work that they will pick up again uh, to to tell about the flight and the things uh, we do up there. OK, this last question is for all three crew members. Like every team, the three of you have different characters and personalities. How would you describe each other? What are your strengths and weaknesses? I'm going to start with Don. Oh, uh, so you want me to describe <laughs> my yes. teammates? Oh, <laughs> uh, gosh. Uh, I'll, I'll make one comment about uh, Andre. I've never seen him without a smile on his face, even if he had plenty of reason to not smile. He just has a smile on his face. And it makes uh, getting through both the good times and the bad times, it facilitates getting through the good times and the bad times when you have a crewmate that you can work well with. Uh, 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 Oleg. Uh, Oleg knows the Russian side of station so well that if I have any questions about how things are going there, I know with uh, Oleg's expertise for both uh, operating the Soyuz spacecraft and the Russian part of the segment, I know that there uh, will not be any issues. Жизнелюбивые и оптимистичные люди. Мне это очень нравится. 
в них эта черта. Поэтому я думаю, что нам будет приятно все вместе работать. I'm, I'm flying with two great minds. Uh, my commander, uh, I mean, it's a very, it's a very pleasant to to fly with uh, with Alec and uh, to be in the simulator, and uh, the way he knows the system, uh, and uh, it's very pleasant and relaxed to uh, to go through all kind of emergencies with him, and that's a very good feeling. And uh, uh, yeah, Don is. Uh, well, we talked about uh, the, the the Saturday science. Uh, Don has a brilliant mind, and I I, uh, I love the way how he thinks and uh, the way uh, the uh, and his humor. Uh, so uh, I must say uh, I enjoy uh, the, the training. Besides that, the training itself is interesting in the preparation, but I enjoy the characters as well. Very pleasant. All right, with that, uh, we'll wrap up our briefing. Thank you, gentlemen. Uh, one programming note, at 3.30 Central Time, we will be carrying live satellite interviews with astronaut Don Pettit on NASA television, again, that beginning at 3.30 p.m. Central Time. To find out more information about the crew and the space station, you can visit our website at www.nasa.gov station. Thank you.